he gives us his all. Speed, endurance, power. Yet his wild spirit burns bright. Spark of ancient myth. Pride of king and conqueror. He was the backbone of civilization. History was forged to the beat of his hooves. Even now, he still lays claim to the heart with all the bold beauty that is the horse. Summer sets off fireworks in the mountains of southern Montana. Spurred by heat and hunger, wild horses converge on the cool green heights, and sparks begin to fly. Stallions spar and court young mares in a drama as old as the hills. The Mustang has become a symbol of the American West. But some say he's a newcomer to these parts, even a trespasser. The truth is tangled in the long and winding history of his kind. It began some 60 million years ago in the forest of North America. Living on leaves, a creature the size of a fox walks the underbrush on padded toes. In time, forests give way to grassy plains. Legs grow long and toes become nimble hooves in a body built for speed. About a million years ago, the first true horses spread across land bridges to Asia and Europe. Their numbers swell, then slowly decline, perhaps due to climate change or the impact of a two-legged predator. To Ice Age hunters, the herds must have seemed inexhaustible. But by 8,000 years ago, horses were extinct in the Americas and dwindling elsewhere into memory and myth. Then somewhere on the steppes of Eurasia, at least 4,000 years ago, the horse inspired someone as more than just a meal. It may have begun as a shaman's ritual or a reckless teenage prank, but some brave soul took a quantum leap and changed the world forever. The horse utterly changed our sense of distance and speed. He carried us forward in space and time and made our world smaller. Great equestrian cultures arose and thundered across antiquity. Today, most have vanished, but here on the steppes of Mongolia, little has changed since the time when the horse became a way of life. Nomads still measure their wealth in livestock and move vast herds with the seasons. Small but hardy, Mongolian horses endure a harsh climate and grow a thick winter coat. When pasture is meager, 
They can survive on very little. Mongolian nomads also herd sheep, goats, and cows, but horses are their greatest pride. Revered, they are largely reserved for riding, and one other important role. Mongolia's national drink, called Iraq, is fermented mare's milk. Life in the saddle begins early, in keeping with a local proverb. A Mongolian without a horse is like a bird without wings. In July, thousands of nomads set up camp on the edge of the capital city, Ulan Bator. They come to celebrate Nadam, an ancient religious festival. National competitions of traditional sports are held, including two days of horse racing. One of the country's top horse breeders, Hang Medic, traveled over a week to take part in what will be his 30th Natam. From a herd of 400 head, he has brought his 12 fastest horses. Also in tow are his grandchildren. For good reason, riders must be under 12 to compete at Natam. Training, however, is no child's play. It's what Hang Medic lives for. Horse training is a passion. My father was a great trainer and he passed that on to me. It's the same for most Mongolian people. We compete at Nadam to see who has the best horse and because we're so proud of our horses. A fine racehorse is a symbol of good luck and happiness. On the day of the first race, preparations begin at dawn. Hats and bright silks will help families spot their little jockeys at a distance. The distinguishing mark of a racehorse is a leather tail wrap, always wound clockwise. Forelocks are also bound. Hang Medic enhances the look with a charm bearing Mongolia's national emblem. He has high hopes for this young stallion. With an offering of mare's milk, Hang Medic's wife invokes the sacred powers of nature to bless horses and riders. A circle of incense purifies. A drop of Iraq protects from harm. An ancient Buddhist chant rings out for luck. Some 500 riders will compete in the first race. Parents on horseback swell their ranks. By tradition, they circle clockwise at a staging area near the finish line. the running of the race is not yet at hand. The starting point lies more than 15 miles away in the open steppe. To reach that point at a walk will take the racers some three hours. Which leaves time to kill for everyone else. Nomads like Hang Medic take the moment to catch up with old friends and trading partners. For people who live much of the year in relative isolation, there's also the irresistible allure of new faces.
For now, small talk belies the drama that's erupting miles away. As 500 horses reach the starting point, and the race begins. Long before they can see the racers, spectators crowd the finish line. According to myth, the dust kicked up by winning horses showers happiness and prosperity on all those it touches. Front runners have been galloping for nearly 30 minutes. By Western standards, this might qualify as an extreme sport. But these are the descendants of Genghis Khan, who forged the largest land empire ever known on horseback. The blue sash of victory goes to the first five horses. A flash of green tells Hang Medic his granddaughter has placed. But a riderless horse sends him off in search of his youngest grandson. After an initial flurry, racers trickle in for another hour. Herd instinct alone will keep a horse going, even one that lacks the fitness and conditioning required for a long-distance run. For some, the strain is too much. When a horse dies on the racetrack, the trainer is dishonored. But the child who has lost a beloved pet reaps only heartbreak. A fall near the starting point dashed the hopes of Hang Medic's grandson. His horse is safe, his bruises minor, but his six-year-old pride will sting until the races are over. Nadam concludes in the National Stadium, 
with a parade of champions. Hang Medic is twice a winner. His grandchildren take two of his horses through their victory laps. A herald sings the praises of the winning horses. Medals and mare's milk do them honor. But for each little rider, the highlight is a kiss from the president of Mongolia. No other nation makes more of the horse. Fiery steed, faithful servant. He is all good things to the Mongolian people. In return, they may succeed in saving the last truly wild horse on Earth. Before the rise of civilization, his kind ranged throughout Asia and Europe. Alert and aggressive, they were elusive prey with their camouflage of tawny coat, their upright two-toned mane. These horses were already rare in 1878, when Russian explorer Nikolai Shavalsky returned from Mongolia. He carried a skull and hide that would prompt the announcement of a new species. In a race for specimens, stallions were slaughtered to subdue mares. Mares were killed to secure foals, Dozens died en route to zoos and animal collectors in the West. Shavalsky's horses were last sighted in the wild in the 1960s. A decade later, fewer than 300 survived, in captivity only. This endangered species was declared extinct in the wild. In 1992, 16 Shavalsky horses from European reserves touched down in Ulan Bator. Their journey was the crowning achievement of Dutch conservationists and Mongolian authorities. Transports were blessed with mare's milk as the horses arrived at a nature reserve established in their honor. The homecoming delighted local people. Their name for the horses is Taki. The word also means spirit. Today, some 80 free spirits roam 120,000 acres under watchful eyes. Park rangers closely track the animal's health and behavior. Breeding success is high. Two generations have been born in the reserve. To increase the gene pool, horses are still brought in from the west. But prospects for a self-sustaining population are promising. Mongolia's preservation of the Taki seems a fitting tribute to an animal who has given us so much. Domesticated, the horse revolutionized our world. But in the process, he was also transformed. The legendary Arab is just one of more than 150 breeds some honed for work, some for sport, others for sheer show.
The Spanish horse boasts one of the oldest pedigrees. His speed and stamina were praised by the Romans. The famous Spanish riding school in Vienna was founded in his name. A dancer's grace made him a favorite of monarchs and earned him the title Royal Horse of Europe. Today, he inspires a new generation. At the Royal Andalusian School of Equestrian Art in the town of Jerez in southern Spain. Few gain admission here. Only first rate horses, trainers, and students. A strict curriculum has produced several Olympic competitors. The school also keeps tradition alive. Once a week, the public is invited in to enjoy the splendors of another age. In 18th century costume, riders recreate the height of classical horsemanship as it was practiced throughout the courts of Europe. Most spectacular are the airs above the ground. Horses naturally leap and kick when fighting. Centuries ago, cavalry mounts were trained to perform these moves in battle. Eventually, each gesture became an end in itself, as formal as ballet. A supreme effort, the capriole, demands vertical loft, virtually in place. Few can perform this exacting dance with the power and precision of the Spanish horse. The purity of the breed is proudly protected in Spain yet his bloodlines extend far and wide. For this was the horse who once conquered a new world. Some 500 years ago, Spanish explorers rode upon the shores of the Americas. Some native people mistook man and mount for a single fearsome creature. But soon they would make the horse their own. Through stealth and trade, Native Americans embraced the horse. It was said they came to each other like long lost brothers. Some called him Sky Dog. He opened vast horizons in this life and haunted their visions of the afterlife. But this cult of the horse would not last. By the 19th century, Native Americans had been robbed of land and livelihood. Their beloved sky dogs were shot or simply set loose. Scores of Indian ponies joined strays and runaways, already thriving in the wilderness. By 1900, over a million horses roamed the American West. But not for long. To make way for cattle and sheep, public lands were cleared of animals considered worthless pests. They were slaughtered by the thousands for pet food, fertilizer, and mere sport. In the 1950s, public outcry denounced the abuses. Still, numbers had dropped below 20,000 by 1971, when a federal law was finally passed to protect the wild horse. 
as a living symbol of the pioneer spirit of the West. Today, the Bureau of Land Management oversees some 45,000 horses on public lands in 10 states. On the Montana-Wyoming border, the Pryor Mountain Wild Horse Range is home to a herd of about 160. Most live in small family groups of several mares, their foals, and a single dominant stallion. His role is to guard his harem and protect his growing offspring. This stallion, known as Raven, is one of the most dominant on the range. A heap of fresh droppings called a stud pile alerts him that potential rivals may be in the vicinity. A band of young bachelor stallions prompts Raven to move his family to a safe distance. Then he advances on the intruders, and confrontation becomes inevitable. Raven may be outnumbered, but at 10 years old, his maturity and experience give him the advantage. As he enters the fray, his band stays put on the sidelines. Most clashes between stallions are more about asserting rank than inflicting harm, and serious injuries are rare. In the end, the bachelors move on unscathed but chastened, and Raven returns to his mares. Occasionally, even mature stallions form alliances. A stud named Starman acts as a subordinate or lieutenant stallion to Flash, who has a mare and foal of his own. Flash tolerates Starman's presence, but allows him no access to his lone mare. In summer, a waterhole fed by melting snowbanks attracts this small band. The mare enjoys a soothing mud bath while her three-month-old foal plays with the idea. But for now, the water holds no appeal for Flash's lieutenant stallion. Starman picks up the scent of another mare and sets off in hot pursuit. The mare's yearling son tries to intercept Starman, but fails to impress such a mature stallion. This mare's own stallion must be just out of sight, a boon for Starman. Still, she rejects his advances. In the end, she gets away, and Starman can only observe the tactics of a more successful suitor. At 
times, the Pryor Mountains seem heaven on earth for horses. Though much of the terrain is arid and winters are harsh, summer pastures can be glorious. The horses have few predators to fear. Most were eliminated by ranching and land development. With high fertility rates, the horses' numbers can increase by 10, even 20% a year. And that means trouble in paradise. In the last three decades, the Bureau of Land Management has removed more than 100,000 wild horses from the range. The roundups are intended to protect public lands from overgrazing and ensure the health of the herds. Excess animals are placed in adoption programs, but supply far exceeds public demand. Horses deemed unadoptable live out their days in holding pens. Even now, the fate of America's wild horses remains an open-ended question. Some 4,000 years of domestication have failed to deprive the horse of his wild instincts. His natural impulse is to flee the company of humans. Brian Newbert makes a living, not breaking, but in his words, starting wild or green horses. This two-year-old quarter horse stud, born on the open range, has never been handled. On his ranch in Northern California, Brian is about to make first contact. Brian will chase the horse until he turns to face his pursuer. The goal is capture the animal's attention and keep it. I'll ask again, good. Now let's see if he leaves with his hindquarters or if he leaves with the whole horse. See, here's the, the first little part is gonna happen here in just a second, I think. Subtle shifts of body language keep the horse focused on Brian. If his attention wanders, I might see if I can get another step closer. As long as he's doing that, I'll just let that soak in. And I'll take another step. And I'll take another one here. He's having trouble with it, but he's trying. He's gonna have to leave here pretty soon. And I'll try to direct him back. There, he adjusted in the rear quarters. That's what I'm gonna need here. Within about 15 minutes, the young stallion has mastered the maneuver. Now Brian presents a new challenge. I might do just a little swing in here and see if he can stand that. And I'll see about, see if I can put that on there without hitting him in the face. And I'll, I'll just, as I come forward, just let that go. And it's kind of scary. And you can see that it's troubling to him a little. So I'll just put just a little pressure till, till he finds his way toward me. See, he keeps thinking his answer is out of here, but the answer's right there. The horse turns to Brian for reassurance, a critical breakthrough. Now he might reach for me. Let's see if, 
you come in here, I'll see if I can get another half a step without scaring him. See how he's reaching for me? Now here's a spot where you want to watch their ears because some of them will, they'll take a run at you. Now I'll just wait here till he reaches like that. See him smelling me instead. Of, there's the first, second time he's ever been touched by a human or he touched a human, I guess, instead. Of, now again, let's see if this head shaking will, will uh, disappear. I'll just keep a little tension there and I'll see if he'll reach for me. And pretty soon I'll reach for him, like right there. We sort of met one another. A little bit of touch in there. A little bit more here. See, he's finding out he can touch me and reach for me now. In a horse, there's a spot in there where they can just turn loose emotionally. As you can see in their eye and their face, a change that comes over them. And they'll begin to drop their head and their eyes will soften and you can just see that they're beginning to trust you. And then you can move right on and really advance then. I'll get my weight shifted back. He's feeling a whole lot better about things now. He's finding out I can touch him and he won't get hurt. Less than half an hour after the first touch, Brian tests the saddle. It's kind of important to swing this on so that it doesn't hit them. So this grab will gradually just lays right over on their back like that. I don't mind seeing one buck with the saddle because being a prey animal, that's his responsibility to not let anything stay up there. That's where the predator has the best advantage. If he can get above and stay with them, then he can have himself a meal. Pretty dreamy now, but we'll see what he's like when he feels that saddle on there. I'd rather he test the saddle out before I get on than, than after I get up there. Now I'm gonna move him off, but ever so softly, if I can. I'm not trying to make him buck. Okay, maybe I'll give him a little consoling. Did you get scared, Bolly? It's been less than two hours since Brian began work, a fairly routine first session. He'll leave the saddle in place for a few more hours, then give the young stallion a well-earned rest until morning. Yesterday's fear gives way to recognition and trust. Today will be another turning point. Social animals feel safest in a group. As a comfort to the young stallion, Brian has corralled several other horses. See, if he wiggles, I'll just wait here till he stands put. Pet him over here as if it was my leg and maybe Get myself kind of set here before he gets untracked. I might let him go right out that way. And I'll just ask him to go. If he gets upset, if he gets scared, wants to run, I'll just try to go with him. If 
people ask me about uh, this new way of working with horses. As far as I know, it's been around as long as there's been horses and men interacting with one another. I don't know how the first man could have ever got on a horse for the first time without having something working for him. I'll get a little bolder as he gets a little more confidence. I'll ask him here to come back to me with this rain little, and he, and he did. The young stallion's first ride lasts no more than 15 minutes and prompts a simple reward. Hey, kid. This just kind of soothes them sometimes, give them a little hugging. This is a place where they, a lot of them just can't stand you have that close. And if you can show them that it's okay to, to uh, be this close, why it's a real relaxing, soothing kind of thing for them. They really have to trust you. By day three, it's time to abandon the security of the corral. A whole new life is beginning for the young stallion. He gets to trust me a whole lot more today, I see. And Brian is left to ponder an age-old mystery about the nature of horses. I often wondered how in the world would they allow somebody to get up on their back and guide them around. They'll take us miles and miles till they're totally, you know, tired, pull wagons and pack loads and all kinds of things. When actually they could kick us or hurt us or buck us off any time, and yet they'll just work their hearts out for us if it's presented to them in a way that they can understand. Pretty special animal, really. Special indeed. No more than 60 years before the first moon landing, the world was driven by horsepower. Every sector of the economy relied on him. Transport and trade, industry and agriculture. No creature served us better in the building of civilization or its occasional overthrow. For millennia, the war horse prevailed in battle. If not for a horse, would Alexander have been great? Who can imagine Attila the Hun or Napoleon on foot? Over a million horses served in World War I. Nearly a third died. In World War II, tens of thousands perished in a battle of bullets and bombs. The age of horsepower was over. And yet there are more horses in the world today than during the 1800s, some 62 million. In an age of technology, perhaps we yearn all the more for the touch of something wild. The horse is no longer changing our world, but he can still change lives, one at a time. In central Georgia, Carol Woolley has loved horses since she was a child. In 1995, a friend told her about an old school horse who had seen better days as a fox hunter and jumper. His name was Carousel, and he needed a home. Carousel was in his mid to late 20s, a little lame, about 100 pounds overweight. He was a little sway back, just a good, quiet lesson pony. You like a goodie? Carol took good care of him. Local children rode him. Soon, Carousel was a favorite. 
In 1996, two weeks after the Summer Olympic Games, the Paralympics came to Atlanta. Some 3,500 athletes attended. For the first time, equestrian events were included. 16 nations sent teams. It was up to event organizers to provide horses for 62 athletes with a wide range of disabilities. Each would be judged on precision, smoothness, and harmony of horse and rider while performing a set pattern in the arena. A call went out to horse owners for calm, well-trained mounts. Carol Woolley volunteered two of her younger horses, but games officials were desperate for more. She thought twice, then sent for old Carousel as well. After a checkup, he was quickly put to the test. And later in the day, they called him for Denmark, and I met Britta Anderson, who was a very small woman in a wheelchair, and I thought to myself, there's no way she's going to ride this pony. She spoke English quite well, and I asked her, have you ever fallen off a horse? And she smiled and looked at me and said, many times. Far from falling, on the day of competition, Britta and Carousel took Carol by surprise. Anderson of Denmark. Anderson. Britta and Carousel made a, a connection. He knew exactly what she wanted, and she knew how to get the most out of him. And he loved her. I'm still not sure how she did it, but they were just a perfect match. The judges agreed. The pair took first place in their division and received the highest score of all the competitors. From Denmark, Britta Andersen, riding Midlands Carousel, owned by Carol Woolley. When they won the gold medal, it was this little pony and a horse trainer from nowhere and a world-class rider. And the thought that they actually won that gold and they earned it, it was probably one of the high points of my life. By the time she returned home, Carol had decided to start a therapeutic riding school. Horseback riding can improve balance and muscle tone, as well as a sense of independence and self-esteem in people with all sorts of disabilities. For Carol, there's no greater reward than to see someone like 13-year-old Sarah take her first ride. We got you now, kid. You're riding, kid. You're riding. When you take a child out of a wheelchair and put him on a horse, he's immediately taller. The walk of a horse mimics the same movement you get to actually walk on your own legs. It gives them a freedom of mobility. It gives them control over something that they may have never known before. They can control where they're going. <laughs> Carol runs the school on grants, donations, and volunteers. And Carousel heads her fleet of gentle horses past their prime. In August of 1998, at a regional show for riders with disabilities, Carol decides to send Carousel into the arena one last time. Nine-year-old Sean Donaldson one of Carol's top students, has never competed before. It's a breathless moment for his parents. Make the old man proud. He got a good horse on him, though. He knows what to do. Young boy and old horse are picture perfect and take a blue ribbon 
in first place, Sean Donaldson. From a first for Sean, a final trophy for Carousel. The competition concludes with a ceremony. As a symbol of retirement, Carol removes the saddle from a little horse of unknown breeding who has meant so much to so many. To him go the full laurels of a champion. He was quite calm, stood through everything. He halfway, I think, understood that we were doing an honor to him. I was a little surprised that he didn't mind us putting flowers on him. He acted like, well, those were his flowers. This is fine. I think he enjoyed it, really. <laughs> he wasn't just an old sway-backed horse with a gray face. He was everybody's dream of a horse. He's served everyone that's ever owned him, every place he's been. He's done everything we've asked him to do all of his life. To me, he symbolizes all the horses that have worked hard all their lives and have given us so much pleasure. He's a fairy tale of a horse, but there's probably thousands of them out there just like him. I guess he's the poster child for all of them. For all they have done for us, for all that they are, may they always have green pastures, each and every one. <laughs>